a cleansing flood. Amen. Amen. Boy, it's good to see everyone out today. It's good to see folks I hadn't seen for a while. Good to see folks that I've only seen for the first time. But if you're here for the first time, we're glad you're here today. We want you to know that you're among friends. You're not among enemies. And we're glad that you decided to come sit shoulder to shoulder with us and sing praises to the God of creation. He is truly worthy of your and my praise. You know, you start thinking about it. You could have been many other places. But you do recognize that God is actually offering something that we all want that nobody else can actually offer us. And so you're here because of God's goodness. You know, one of the things you have to understand is that our God is a gracious God. God has shown us love that while we were yet sinners, he let, he let his son die for the ungodly. So God has given us something we do not deserve is grace. But we also recognize that our God is a God of mercy. Because we recognize that the wages of sin is death. And all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And so uh, just imagine if you would, if God had said, you know, last week that he's going to call his judgment due. As soon as you did the wrong thing, said the wrong thing, or thought the wrong thing, he was going to call his judgment due on you this week. Who would be here today? The whole building would be empty from the pulpit on back. So our God has shown mercy. But also, you have to understand he's a merciful God where he looks at our pitiful condition and does something about it. So God is truly worthy of our praise, amen, because really he's, he cares about us, and so he's conditioning us. He's, we're here today so that for two reasons. Number one, your main reason for coming and gathering with God's people is, number one, you need to offer God his due. Amen. You see, this is not the be kind to God hour. This is when we all show our love for God together, amen. okay, because you should be praising God every single day, amen. okay? But also, we gather ourselves together to uplift one another because sometimes we have tough weeks. Anybody other than me? Right? Sometimes we just need enough, we just need that boost to strengthen us to last and be faithful another day. And see, that's what this gathering is for. So your whole goal today is just to not to see what you can come get. Your whole goal should be what did you bring today? Amen. Because if you came today looking out for me, praising God and looking out for me, and I'm concerned about you, nobody gets left out. Amen. So I truly hope you're here today, and when it's all said and done, you're able to say it's been great. It has been wonderful to gather with God and his family. And true blessing. Everybody, if you would, turn in your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 2. We're still studying in 1 Peter. Now, for those who are hearing me for the first time, yes, this is the speed that I speak at. <laughs> I do talk very, very fast. I was just talking to, I was talking to a friend earlier. We had a lot in common. He's from Texas. I was from Texas. Went to California from California. He's in Arizona now. I'm in Arizona now. But see, even though I'm from Texas, he was from North Texas. And I'm from Central Texas. But even though Texans talk slow, I'm not that Texan. I'd be that one selling you cows, you know, that auctioneer. That's me, right? <laughs> but uh, no, I speak fast. But everything is getting recorded. And if I go too fast, go back and look at the recordings and you can, actually, uh, uh, you can actually check the verses and everything. Because if I say something wrong, I want you to bring it to my attention, okay? Because my whole goal is to, you leave here to saying God said, not how said. So, we've been studying from 2 Peter. And in 2 Peter, what we've been talking about, we've been talking about, you know, uh, it was based upon an understanding of what God has already done for us. We have a lively hope, a living hope. And we also recognize that the word of God liveth and abideth forever. It's not going to change. Meaning, what you have to understand, when God is, the only time something changes with God's word is when God makes the change. Time does not change what God said. And so what we need to understand is that since it's not going to change, we need to live our lives according to what God has actually said. Because God's word is not changed by people or time or climate or or situation or uh, generation or whatever, okay? And then what we did, we also need to recognize that as children of God, there's certain things we need to get rid of out of our lives, like lying, uh, like hypocrisy and guile and, and evil speaking. And we should, we should want to, to get as much of God's word within us as possible because therein lies the blessing. We also talk about how it is that we are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, not because you and I are so great, it's not anything that we have done that has made it whereas we're worthy of what God has given us. It's because of how good our God is that he has taken us from being children of wrath and to be his children. And since we're his children, we have all the rights and privileges that go along with it. Just like his son, Jesus, when Jesus was in his darkest hour and he cried out, Abba, Father, you need to understand because we're children by adoption. Here's what, Paul, here's what Paul says in Romans chapter 8. We have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but we receive the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. For the spirit bears with with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. If so, be it that we suffer along with it. What's my point I'm trying to make here? That everything that Jesus, the man, the man Jesus got, we get also. So when you understand that he's, we're, a, we're called a royal priesthood, what makes us royal? Because we're in the family of God. That's why. 
That's why John the Revelator says that we are kings and priests, not because of who we are, because we're in the family of the king. We're royalty now. But we're also priests able to offer sacrifices holy and acceptable unto God. Amen. So it's not because of who we are. It's because of where God has taken us from and placed us in his family with all the rights and privileges that go along with being in the family of God. Right? Amen. So in other words, we don't glory in anything we've done. We glory in what our father, what Jesus has done for us. Amen. That's what we brag about. Right? Amen. So we're, we're, we're sacrifices. Now, here's the next point. Um, let's, let's all read together. First Peter chapter 2, beginning in verse number 11, and we're going to read through verse number 17. It says, Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul, having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak uh, where, whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme or, or unto governors as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of them that do well. For so it is the will of God. That with well-doing ye may put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. As free and not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, but as the servants of God. Amen. Honor all men. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. Honor the king. Amen. Now, I'm going to tell you something. The subject that I'm going to cover today is a very, very touchy subject. And really, this subject is not hard to understand but it's hard to accept sometimes. But what you have to understand is that when God actually says something, God's word is truth, it is not opinion. God's word applies to all those that are subject to him, whether you're old, whether you're young, whether you're black, white, brown, sky blue, yellow, it makes no difference. God's word is always truth. Amen. And so what we need to understand is that we saw what our role is as, as, as priests and as children of God. But he's also given us some directions on how we live and how we deal with the governments that are set before us. And that is something we need to learn from the word of God if we're going to actually make it through what we got going on in this country right now. Because you, be you don't have to be very politically astute to realize there's a serious issue going on right now. That's right. Everything that God has said is right has been brought into question. That's right. Everything that God said is wrong has been brought into question. And there's, and there's all these groups divided on both sides of these issues. And we need to ask ourselves as Christians, where do we stand on these things? You see, if you want to, you can go back in one of my lessons to look at something that I've, a lesson I did on a Wednesday night a few weeks before that actually explains very, very plainly to us as Americans who've been raised to believe that our voice really means something. You need to understand that ultimately God decides who gets an office in every land. God decides. I know a lot of times we like to think that we decide those things, how arrogant we are to think those things when God said, by me, do judges judge and rulers rule. You see what we need to understand? If God says he's the one who does that, matter of fact, we're going to make some notes that even the corrupt leaders God puts in office. Right. And he does it for a reason. This is the reason we need to know what our place is. Just so we know how we need to respond here. Now, again, I know this lesson is not going to be very uh, 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 popular. But it's going to be one of those lessons that you got to just sit down and grab a handful of faith and trust God on this one. Because God is telling us something and he gives us a reason why he wants us to do things this way. The first thing we need to look at here is that we've seen here, my, my lesson text is going to be coming for, to, from verse number 13. But in the previous verses, we actually see here that we are pilgrims. And as pilgrims, we have blessings and we have responsibilities. And what we've seen in the verses prior to verse number 13, we see that we're pilgrims and strangers. And that our conduct needs to be honest among those that see us. In other words, anybody, whether anybody, non-believers need to see us and see that there's a difference between us and everybody else. It needs to be an honest or an honorable way of living. And, 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 but what about our responsibility to those that are in government over us? How do we live before them? When our true citizenship is in heaven, do we have responsibilities to the countries or to the governments here on earth? We're going to answer that question from the scriptures. You see, Peter addresses this question in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 13 through 17. 
The first thing you see that as pilgrims, he's talking to believers, by the way, just so you get this. And you have to decide, are you a child of God or not? Okay. So as children of God, as believers, as the royal priesthood, he says that our responsibility is, number one, is to submit. Verse number 13 again says, the verse says, submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake. Now, just admit it. Our problem is that we, we can see very clearly what God is saying, but we also recognize who we have in office. <laughs> y'all stop playing like y'all know what I'm talking about. We recognize that, and I don't care whether you're Democrat or Republican. You see, what ends up happening is we can see very clearly what the Bible says, but we look at who we have in office, whether it be now, or whether it be last year, or whether it be what's coming up. We still, sometimes we, we, it's, it's hard to put your, your life in submission to somebody who you don't believe has your well-being in mind. Amen. Nod your head if you know what I'm talking about. Amen. But it still didn't change what he said, did it? No. Let's make sure we catch this here, because he's going to give us a reason why. You see, we are to submit to every ordinance of man. The word submit means to, sub, to be subject to. To place oneself under subjection or to render oneself subordinate. You see, this isn't the only time that in this epistle that Christians are told to submit. You see, the same word that Peter used here, we see in, in, in verse number 18, he actually says, Servants, be in subject to your masters with fear, not only to to the good and the gentle, but also to the forward. Not just to your, the easy bosses, but the ones that are hard to deal with. Okay? Chapter 3 and verse number 1. Likewise, you wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not in the word, they may be without the word, be won by the conversation of their wives. First uh, Peter chapter 5 and verse number 5. He said, likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject to one another. And be clothed with humility, for God resisted the proud and giveth grace unto the humble. So this word submit is used many different times. And so we understand it means to place yourself under. In other words, you, you, you place yourself under submission. And in this case, back to our scripture text, we are to be a subject, uh, submit to every ordinance of man. Now the word ordinance means a creation or something prepared for or prepared by. Therefore, the expression ordinance refers not in particular to a particular law passed by the government, but to the civil government or the institution itself. Now I'm going to let that sink in for one second because we're going to build up on this. And see, that's hard for us because we've never lived in a country where we actually had a king or we had a dictator. Right? And since we don't, we've never had those things, we always feel that we actually have some kind of right to be able to stand against and to shake a fist of rebellion in the face of somebody we don't like. But when you understand the context that this is written in, you're going to see very clearly what God is saying here and why he wants us to be, do this. It's not for any reason, but it's a very particular reason. And before you preach this lesson to yourself, let me finish it here. Because what you have to understand, God wants us to, to submit to the government. But there are exceptions that he's made. And we, just need, to, we need to know the exceptions so that we can be seen as faithful in God's eyes. Okay? So, note also that we are to submit to everyone. He didn't say some of them. Every, every, uh, uh, why did he say? I lost my page here. Submit yourself to every ordinance of man. It's what the Bible actually says. So, let's note this. Every ordinance, whether it be a monarchy, whether a democracy, whether a totalitarian state, the responsibility of pilgrims is still the same. Submit. Now, I know this is one of those things we have to think about. You see, realize our, our, our headquarters and our home and our citizenship is primarily in heaven. Yes, we are, we are, we, we do use our citizenship as American citizens to our advantage when we should. You know, when Paul was getting beaten up by the Roman government, he said, wait a minute, is it lawful for you to beat me up? I'm a Roman citizen. He used his Roman citizenship to save his life. You see my point? There's nothing wrong with using the laws of the land for your own advantage as long as you're using the laws of the land properly. But you have to understand our citizenship is in heaven. Our headquarters is in heaven. And because of who our headquarters and who our master is, who our God is, our king, has told us to submit. Uh -huh. 
The reason that we submit is not because we got a good government and we got and the president we like or the government the government we like is, is a political party that we like. We don't submit because of that. We submit because who our God is. Amen. You see, Amen. Paul taught this principle in Romans chapter thirteen. And in verse number one, Paul said, let every soul be subject unto higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisted the power resisted the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive of themselves damnation. You're starting to get the picture here. You see... Paul taught the same principle that Peter's teaching here. All the apostles taught the, taught the same thing because they were not teaching their own words. They were teaching. They were guided by the Holy Spirit what to say. So they're saying the same thing because the same God is telling them the same thing. Okay? So we must be subject to show submission by, by paying taxes and paying customs and showing respect and showing honor to officials. You saw that even godly men in those days would call like most honorable festus. You know, these people that didn't believe and could care less about God, but he still paid them honor. Okay? Recognize the position that they hold. Okay? So our responsibility as pilgrims to the government of men under which we live is quite simple. Submit. You don't say because our citizenship is in heaven we ain't paying taxes. Look, I'm going to pay taxes. I just don't want to pay more than I need to be paying. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I'm going to pay what's legally I got to pay. And not a dime more if the Lord helps me. You know? <laughs> That's just me. But my point is, we do submit. And we give to them what, it, what is due. But submission is always not always that easy. What reason do Peter and Paul give that might motivate us to submit to our government as we should? You see... Even though we know it's right, let's just admit, it ain't always easy. You see, the right thing is always the right thing, but the right thing ain't always the easy thing. You see, because we, we're having to live it. We're having to see who it is that we're presented with. The reasons why, let me give you some, a couple of reasons why that we can see very, very plainly here. You see, the, there's two good reasons why. The first reason we see in the beginning part of verse number 15 of 1 Peter chapter 2, for so is the will of God. <laughs> Now, if you're a child of God, that should sum it up for you. So is the will of God. If you want to do something different, don't say it's God's will now. Right. Right. So is the will of God. And the second reason we see in verse number 13, we do it for the Lord's sake. Amen. You see, that ought to suffice those who are true servants of God. If you're not a true servant of God, if you're still learning, that might not suffice you. But for somebody who truly understands and wants to submit to God, that should suffice you. But Peter explains why this is the Lord's will. He didn't just tell you because do it because I'm the Lord said it. He tells us why. And the reason why in verse number 15, the second part is to put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. You see, what you have to understand is we find ourselves acting like everybody else. How do they see the difference? We need to silence foolish men. You see, because of our allegiance to a heavenly king, Christians are often falsely accused of sedition and treason and causing problems. You realize that everybody in this country has the right to say anything they want to except people that believe what God said. Wow. You ever, now, let me just tell you what I'm talking about. Y'all do realize that because of our First Amendment right, you have people that can protest publicly. We have people that can walk up and down the street dressed any way they want to live and want to live doing lewd stuff, saying evil things. Men with men, women with women, hateful speech against a person or, or against, a, against a society or against a, a, a creed or, or against a, a nationality and protected by law. Right. How do we ever get to the point that just saying what God says has become hate speech? Mm. Let me tell you what I'm talking about just so you get it. That was a time years ago when I lived in California. This actually spread out because it used to be just in San Francisco. Now it's in, in Florida now. It's also in Southern California now. That every single year, I'm just going to use this as an example because there's other examples of this also. You know, you know every year they had the Dudai Parade. And the Dudai Parade is where everybody that has that lifestyle can do what they want to do that day. And they're protected to walk up and down the street, dress or not dress any way they want to dress, do all kind of lewd stuff in public, right? And protected by their First Amendment right. And there's people that just stand on the curb on a public sidewalk every single year read Romans chapter 1 out loud from the Bible and get arrested for hate speech Man. did y'all know that happens yeah. to where people 
that just say what God says. Yeah. Now, just saying what God says is so unpopular politically because so many people don't want you checking anything that they're doing from the Bible. Yeah. Mm. So anybody that just tries to say what God says, all of a sudden now, is considered hate speech or an assault on my person. Mm. How do we get to a point in our country like that? Y'all do realize that back in the days of, of the apostles, that, they, that, that, that the, government, even the government was set up to where people would die because of this profession of faith. And we've been able to benefit from religious freedom for all these years, but don't ever think that it could not get to the point to where not only you can be persecuted, you know, uh, just, just, just publicly over it, it could literally cost you your physical freedom for your professional faith standing firm on what God has actually said. And we always seem to think that that's not possible in this country we live in, and yet we're seeing it played out before our eyes right now. Yeah, to where a person just goes and says, like, look, I'm going to just show you what I'm talking about. If a person just goes and says, like, look, I don't care what you're saying, there's only male and female. Now, if you just say something like that publicly on the news, man, you'll get drugged through the dirt. <laughs> and we base it on just what God said. To the point where if anybody says anything any different, mm. right. something as simple as there's just male and female. Mm. Right. And because you didn't call me by my preferred pronoun, I consider that an assault on my person. An assault, really. <laughs> mm. I'm just using one example. Yes. My point I'm trying to get us to understand here is that even in tough times like this, you need to understand why it is that we're not physically lashing out against anybody. Because many times, even in the days of, even in the, days of the apostles, right after Jesus had been resurrected, these, these Christians were, were, being, were being accused of sedition. In Acts chapter 13, 17, verses 5 through 8, you see that Christians, Christians in Jerusalem, were, were, were being blamed for the problems and the uproar in the city only because there's people that did not want to submit to what even the prophecies that foretold had come to pass. And so they were commanded, do not preach this Jesus in this city. Because you Christians that are preaching this, this, this Jesus Christ are causing sedition against the powers that be against Caesar. That's what the whole accusation was in Acts chapter 17. And yet the exact same thing is happening right now. And we're not making a comparison. The problems going on in this country are because people are Bible thumpers and they're hiding behind the Bible and what the Bible actually said. Like, if you're going to hide anywhere, you need to hide behind what Jesus said. Amen. Amen. You see, people ignorantly want to blame us for what's going on in this country. Like, we're the problem. But see, by doing good, in other words, submitting to the government, to the authorities, we can silence, we can put a muzzle on this ignorant charges. Let me help you understand what I'm talking about here. You see, I know a lot of times people are on different sides of the fence on what actually happened on January 6th. But what you have to understand, on January 6th, that mob that stormed the Capitol, those were not Christians. And if any were Christians, they need to repent because that's not who we are. Now, I know people get quiet on that one. Let me help you understand something very, very plain. You know, how God goes about changing the powers to be whatever. You need to understand that is not us, though. You see, there's 8 billion people in this world. Let the 8 billion worry about the worldly stuff. But we need to be about the Lord's business. <laughs> so I'll stand firm on that statement. Those who by force cause the death and malicious attack on the government and the people that stood there were not Christians according to the scriptures. And if anybody was a Christian that was a part of that, you need to repent. Let me go ahead and move on. <laughs> I know they ain't popular. Because God gave the reason. The reason that God says submit because it is God's will, number two, for the Lord's sake. Then Paul gives another good reason. In Romans chapter 13 and verse number one. Government authorities that exist have been appointed by God. God put them there. You see, this truth is emphasized a few different places. If you go to the book of Daniel, and in Daniel chapter 2, and in verse number 20, 
And Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of the God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. And he goes on and says, and he charges, he changes the times and the seasons. He removeth kings and setteth up kings. He giveth wisdom unto the wise and knowledge unto them that know understanding. You need to make, if, if you don't, I don't have time to do that whole lesson again, but go back and look at that lesson. Who really decides who governs our country? Amen. You're going to see from the scripture, God has made it plain more than one time. And it's important that you understand that. The reason being, because if you understand it, that God is the one that puts people in power and God is the one that takes people down. If your, if your candidate doesn't get in, that'll stop you from being mad at your brothers or sisters who vote a different way than you do. That's right. So if somebody's in office that you didn't like. And yet you're a child of God and they're Christians and you're all in the same family of God. And yet you're mad at them because of how they're voted. Look, if, if, if your if your person does not get into power, don't be mad at your brothers or sisters because they're not the ones that put in there. God put in there. Amen. Let me help you understand this, because just a lot of times people always want to say these things. Right. I remember the big old argument was coming out like, well, you know, the whole thing Well, Donald Trump was God. God put in there. I'm like, that's right. God did put in there. Just like he put Barack Obama there. Right. Just like he put George Bush there. Just like he put Joe Biden there. Just like he put Richard Nixon there. Just like he put Eisenhower. He put everybody there. That's right. When you settle that in your mind, it'll stop you, us from being mad. You can't stop the world from being mad at other, each other. But the Lord's family, we're one. We have a king. Amen. You see... We have to understand is that it is it is God's will and God has appointed him. You see, he actually tells us very, very plain that God is the one who sets up. God's the one who takes down. And in Daniel chapter four and in verse number 17, he actually says this matter is by the creed of the watchers and the demand by the word of the holy ones to the intent that the living may know that the most high talking about God ruleth in the kingdom of men and giveth it to whomsoever he will and set it up over the basis of men. Let me tell you something he's saying here. God, God ruleth and he had in the affairs of men and he'll set up the worst people over men. God said he'll do that. See, a lot of times we think because a bad man gets in office that somebody else did that. Like, no, God sets up even the most debased people. And he does it for a reason. You need to make sure you understand there's a reason behind all these things. Okay? We see him also say in verse number 25 of the same chapter. And they shall he says in verse number 25 of the same chapter of Daniel chapter 4. He says that they shall drive thee from men and thy dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field, and they shall make thee to eat grass. In other words, that same one that he actually raised up, yeah. he used that same Nebuchadnezzar to show his power. Where Nebuchadnezzar was brought to his knees and had to eat grass like an animal. Right. But God still put him there. Right. Now here's what we need to settle in our mind, just so we get this. We see examples in the scriptures. In Exodus chapter 9, verse number 16, God made it very plain that he's the one who set Pharaoh up and why he set Pharaoh up to show his hand and his power among his people and even among Egypt to show who he is. But also we see the same thing the, the, for the, uh, the king of Assyria in, in Isaiah chapter 10, verse 5, 5 through 12. You see that he set this king up as his whipping stick on all these other nations and even his own people. Now, what is the point I'm trying to make here? Why does God actually raise people up for power? In the scripture, we see two different reasons God raises people up for power. He raises people up in power to deliver nations, but he also raises people up and places them in power to bring nations down. Amen. Yep. Amen. Now, here's the point we need to make sure we understand here. If God wants to send someone to this country, to this nation, to deliver this nation, He's going to deliver this nation however he wants to do it. But let me take this one step further just so you get it. If God is calling his judgment due on this country and God sets a man up in power to bring this nation down, there's nothing the Democrats or Republicans can do to stop it. The only people that are going to be able to make a difference is you and me. Because what we have the responsibility to do is not vote, but to pray for all those that are in power over us so that we can live godly and peaceful lives. Amen. You see, the message that we have is greater than any message that any Democrat or Republican candidate is going to bring. Because the message we have is the only way that, can, that two men that are diametrically opposed to each other can become one and agree. Amen. Do you understand when Jesus actually called his disciples, he called a zealot and a tax collector to work together? And another, a zealot would have been one who would have taken a tax collector and slit his throat in the dark. Yeah. 
tax collectors, what they did working for the, for the Roman government, not only did they collect taxes for the Roman government, they, they lined their own pockets. And so they were hated by all the Jews. Yet Jesus got a zealot and a tax collector to work together. What was it? They were diametrically opposed to each other, but they came together based on who the master is. Amen. Amen. You see, we need to make sure we understand what our role is. We need to understand that when God actually sets someone up in power, we need to pray that whoever God sets up in power is not to bring this nation down because that, hurt, that, that hurts everybody. Amen. But see, God decides those things. That's why you need to settle these things inside your mind and just decide that you want to do what God says. Another, another reason that Paul says that we need to obey, uh, submit ourselves because being, being the case to resist the government means that you're resisting God himself. Romans chapter 13, verses, verses 2 through 4. When you resist the government, you're resisting God himself. So, lest we find ourselves resisting God himself, as God's pilgrims, we freely submit to the powers that are ruling over us. Amen. In so doing, we also silence those who falsely accusing us of being the problem, because we're not the problem. <laughs> we have the information that's the solution to the problem, but we're not the problem. Amen. You see, our God, our Savior is the solution to the problem. And what's funny, whether they're independent, Democrat, Republican, communist, whoever else, everybody in our country seems to be trying to claim Jesus as theirs. And I ask you a very simple question. Was Jesus a Democrat or Republican? Neither. <laughs> Neither. He's the master. Everybody. Kings of, he's the king of kings, Lord of lords. Everybody's subject to him. He doesn't follow nobody else. So neither. So they stop trying to claim him as their own for their own benefit. You know, and so my point I'm trying to make is, is that, you know, we don't want to find ourselves uh, uh, in, 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 at odds with God. But this principle of submission to government, with, it, 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 but it has exceptions. Is there ever a time when Christians are justified in refusing to obey governmental authorities? From Peter himself, we learned something very, very, very important here. You see, Peter made it very, very plain that we, uh, we are to submit ourselves to a government. So here's the question we have to ask ourselves. What if the government is oppressive? What if it's an oppressive government? Consider the government conditions which Peter was under at that time. The government was a totalitarian government at that time. He was under the, he was under the, 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 the Jews at this time were under the subjection of Nero. Now, if anybody knew anything about Nero, you know that Nero could care less about Jesus and the word of God. Nero was a ruler. He was evil. He, was, he, was, he felt that he was a god among men. He felt that his word was reign supreme. What he said, it goes. He was the government. He was right and he was wrong. He, was, he decided what was right and he was, what was wrong. And yet under his reign, Christians suffered greatly. You see, Peter even made it very, very plain all the things that were happening under the reign of Nero. In 1 Peter chapter 4, he's telling Christians verse, in verse number 12, he said, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing had happened to you. But rejoice insomuch as ye are partakers of Christ's suffering, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye shall be glad also with exceeding joy. He also says in 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 8 and 9, he said, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, is a roaring lion, walking about seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. Everybody's having to deal with this stuff. You see, and yet even under that type of government, under that same type of government that history tells us that the same person, Peter, that wrote this was crucified by that same government. That Paul was beheaded by that same government. And under oppressive governments, our responsibility still remains very, very plain, plain to submit. You see, what does the Bible tell us that we're all supposed to be doing? Paul says in 1 Timothy chapter 2, in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse number 1, here's what Paul says, who was subject to these governments. 
who was subject to this oppression, who suffered all these things at the hand of evil men for his profession of Jesus Christ. And here's what he told Timothy the evangelist to teach and to go and tell the churches and the brethren. He said, I exhort you, verse number one, 1 Timothy chapter, one, chapter 2, verse number 1. I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercession, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and for all that in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior. Amen. Let me help you understand something, brothers and sisters, so you understand what your responsibility is. I don't know what your participation is when it comes down to, to, to politics. What you have to understand is that this is a misconception that we have inside the church. That if we have somebody in office that we don't like in office, that is teaching things that we don't want, and that's led, guiding our country in a, in a direction that we know we should not be going. We always put out there, and we like to put uh, these flyers and tracks back at the back of the church building out there for people to come and see. You need to vote to get the right person in. You know what happens anytime somebody Somebody brings that Democrat or Republican stuff and puts it back in the back for you back there where, uh, where, the, where the information is at, I rake it right into the trash. <laughs> Amen. Because we think to ourselves that if we can just vote the right person in, our lives can be better. Let me ask you a quick question for those that are 50 years or older. How's that working out for us? <laughs> <laughs> it ain't working. Y'all know it ain't working, right? <laughs> Here's the point. He didn't tell us to make sure we vote the right person in for, for our government. He said we need to pray for them. That's right. We need to pray. What do we need to pray? That we can live, we can live peaceful and godly lives. You do realize that the people that find, that find themselves in office can put laws or resolutions or ordinances in place that can make it hard for us to do what God has commanded us to do. Mm -hmm. And we need to pray that people will allow us to continue to do those things. Because what you have to understand is that here's the rub that we're going to get to in a second. That if a government puts something in place that goes against what God has told us, we still have to do what God says. Even if it costs us our time, our money, our reputation, and even our lives, we still have to do it. You understand why we need to pray? That we pray for everybody that's ruling over us? Amen. Do you understand as children of God that God inclines his ear to you, that he hears you? Amen. Yeah. Yeah. We need to make sure you understand that the message that we have is more important than anything than the conservatives or the liberals or the, or the intermediate half for this country. Yes. Everybody's looking for a better life and a better way of life and, 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 and equality and justice and, and agreement in this nation. And we're thinking that Democrats or Republicans or Independents are going to do it and it's getting worse. When you understand that the only one that can bring everybody together is God. Amen. The psalmist says in Psalm 111, 121, verse 1, I lift up my eyes to the hills from whence cometh my help. Too many times we're thinking that we can lift up our eyes and look to Capitol Hill for help us with the condition that we're in. But the psalmist was making a rhetorical statement. He said, I lift up my eyes to the hill. Where does my help come from? My help coming from the Lord, which maketh the heaven and the earth. You see, we need to stop looking to Capitol Hill for our issues. We need to start praying to God and looking to God to change what's going on in this country. Don't you understand why the message that you have is more important than anything that the Democrats or Republicans are putting out? Don't you understand why we need to submit so we don't look like everybody else? Christians are the best citizens, not because of the country that we live in. Because of the God we serve, we're the best citizens. You see... What we need to understand is, is that we need to pray for our rulers. God knows what's going on with his people. And we need to pray that God will actually see fit to give to us rulers that will make our lives easier to live godly and live peaceful lives. And if God answers our prayers, nobody can stand against him. The only exception we have I made allusion to this earlier. The only exception we have is, if you had to ask yourself this question, must we obey God rather than man? I can still remember when our government tried to put into place that you couldn't gather more than 50 people in one spot at a time, and then got down to 10 people back because of the plague. You know, you actually have, we have a command to not forsake and assemble ourselves together as a matter of something, but exhorting one another so much more. And one of the things I try to tell brothers and sisters, like, you need to understand, we're supposed to obey the ordinance of men. 
But when it contradicts what God says, we got to do exactly what God said. For that reason, we never shut our doors here. Amen. Not because we're trying to stand in defiance, but we don't want to stand in defiance of God. Amen. You see, we must obey God rather than man. You see, Paul's, uh, uh, you see in Acts chapter 4, what, what ended up happening when Peter and the other apostles were teaching in Jerusalem. The governing bodies that would be, they were under Roman rule, but they were also under the rule of the chief priests and the, and, and, the, and the religious elite in Jerusalem. And the religious elite in Jerusalem commanded that you not speak at all the name or teach the name of Jesus Christ. They were commanded those things. And he said, but Peter and John answered and said unto them, whether it be right for in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, you judge. But we cannot but speak the things which you have seen and which we have heard. And in chapter 5, we also see the same situation. In chapter 5, beginning in verse number 27, he actually says, And when they had brought them, talking about they gathered the disciples together, and when they had brought them, they set them before the council, and the high priest asked them, saying, Did we not straightway command you that you should not teach in this name? And behold, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine, and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than man. What is my point? What you need to understand is the only exception that we have as Christians to not submit ourselves. The only time we can actually refuse to do what our government says is when they try to force us to disobey God. We must then obey. We must then not obey the government. We must obey God. Amen. But we need to understand, even when you look at Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were, under, they were under a king that did not know God, that wanted people to bow down. But you have to understand, they were still able to live a godly lives even under, under that type of oppression. So it'll make a difference what the situation is. You can submit to the government. But when the government tries to put something into place to where you have to bow down or do something different than what God says, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and Daniel knew already, I don't care what you do, we are not bowing down. Because we will worship nobody but the Lord God Almighty. Amen. So you need to understand is the only excuse that we have to disobey what God has said. I mean, what, what, the, what the government has said is when it goes against what God has taught. And even then, it is only the particular laws that are designated to force us to disobey God do we have the right to break. We have no authority to break any other laws in protest. Rather, we are charged to pray for those in authority Amen. and to submit to them in all other areas. Such is our responsibility as pilgrims under whatever government we may find ourselves as we sojourn here on earth. Even though we have liberty and freedom in Christ, we should use that freedom in serving the Lord. Amen. First Peter chapter 2 verse number 16. And, and as we do so, we will show honor and respect to those in authority. Amen. First Peter chapter 2 verse number 17. And those in authority that trouble us what you need to understand, don't think that they're going to get away with this. Those that are in authority that trouble God's people, there is going to come a reckoning. First Thessalonians chapter 1, just so you know, because I know a lot of times we don't want to get ran over. Nobody wants to get ran over. But you have to understand that we live a certain way just so we can live where people can see us and that we are different and we can glorify and they can glorify God based on the way we live our lives. Not they glorify us, but glorify God the based on the way we live our lives. Everybody's claiming to be Christians. Everybody's claiming to be followers of Jesus Christ saying this is God's country. But when it comes down to God's word, nobody wants to see what he's saying here. Amen. You see, we're living. We're living lives that are holy and acceptable to God. So we can prove that God's word is good, that God's word is right and that God's word is, is perfect. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 6, I mean, chapter 1, beginning in verse number 6. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, beginning in verse number 6. Oh man, I got myself the wrong verse. I'm sorry, I may have gone the wrong way. I'm sorry, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. He says in verse number 6, Seeing it is a righteous thing which God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you, 
and to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in a flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know God and that obey not the gospel of Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord, from the glory of his power, when he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe because, they, because our testimony among you was believed in that day. Now, here's the point I want to try to make sure you understand here. Verse number six says, seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. Anybody that has caused God's people trouble are going to have a heavy price to pay later on. It is not our responsibility to bring vengeance upon anybody. Because believe me, our job is to make sure that people that are troubling us that are doing it ignorantly have a chance to make their life right with God so they can be saved also. But for those who trouble God's people, those who do not obey the gospel of Jesus Christ, a heavy weight has been put upon you. So don't think that God does not see what's happening. Don't think that God wants to make you his whipping, make you, make you uh, uh, just a, a whipping stick on everybody. and Everybody just beat up on you any way they want to beat up on you. No, you have to understand that those that in authority that trouble us will pay for it in one day. Amen. Of course, we live in a country that allows freedom of religion. We should, be, we should be especially quick to show our respect and submission. To thank God daily for this wonderful privilege. Because many people do not have the privilege that we have. There's many places in the world today where people literally are sought out and persecuted because of the profession of Jesus Christ. If anybody should be glorifying God and praising God and showing what this scripture is truly talking about truly in a country that we live in that gives us the freedoms that we have we should speak these things and glorify God because of it Amen. and so when you ask yourself this question where do you stand speaking of freedom of religion have you taken advantage of these freedoms by rendering obedience to what God has actually said Amen. you see here's the thing many times we find ourselves caught up more caught up in politics than caught up in the work of Jesus Christ. Amen. And what you have to understand, we're about the Lord's business. Let worldly people take care of that worldly stuff. How about we be about the Lord's business? Amen. You see, the whole thing we need to make sure we understand is we want to make sure that we're, we remain in God's graces. Amen. So that whether we live or whether we die, we're still blessed by God, right? Amen. And what we need to understand is that the only way that can be made possible is you have to listen to what the Lord has said. You see, we have to understand we have a king who's the king of kings and lord of lords. He is your lord. He is your Christ. Yes. And many times religious people think that because they're religious and they know who God is, they're all right with God. But Jesus in John chapter 8 was talking to people that called themselves children of God by descendants of Abraham. And yet the ones who were looking forward to the Messiah and the Messiah standing right in front of them and they cannot see who Jesus is. And Jesus told religious people that unless you believe that I am here, you will die in your sin. So being religious is not enough to save you. You got to believe who Jesus is. He is the Lord and your Christ. And then to those that believed him in verse number 31, it said, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciple indeed, and you will know the truth. And what shall the do, truth do? Shall set you free. They said, we be, we be Abraham, see, we've never been in bondage to any man. Was that a true statement by Israel? No, that's a lie. You see, he told them that you are your father, the devil. He's a liar and the father of it. And they were standing there lying, right? And Jesus said, Any, anyone who commits sin is the servant of sin. He's talking about being free from sin. So if you want to be free from sin so you can be righteous and you can be declared righteous by God and, and be in fellowship with God, you've got to believe who Jesus is and you've got to believe what he's saying. Amen. You must also believe what he did. Like Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse number 1. He said, Brother, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, wherein you stand by which you are saved, if you keep in memory that which I delivered unto you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. You see, what you have to understand is you've got to believe not only who Jesus is, believe what Jesus is saying, what he, believe what he did for you. He died for your sins according to the scriptures. And when you go back and look at what the scriptures foretold, he died a horrible death. Yes. Yes. A horrible death. Not like we see on TV. It was a murder scene. He was beaten beyond recognition, Isaiah chapter 52 and 53. He had his beard plucked from his face. The psalmist actually said that he was beaten so bad he could look down and his bones stared back at him. Yes. Mm. That should tell you two things. Number one, how ugly sin is in God's eyes. And number two, just how much God loves you. Amen. That he would go that far for you yes. and for me. So you got to believe what Jesus did. Yes. And you also got to believe how you benefit from that. Yes. He died for the sins of the whole world, but the world's not saved. 
So you got to believe who he is. You got to believe what he's saying. So when Jesus actually says that you must be willing to confess him before men, you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my father was in heaven. But if you deny me before men, I'll deny before my father was in heaven. If you deny Jesus his rightful place in your life, there's no scenario that that turns out good for you if you deny him. That's right. You must be willing to, to confess him every day to anyone who he is to you, both Lord and Christ. Everybody wants a savior, but nobody wants to be told what to do. Here's news for you. He's not going to be your savior unless he's your Lord. So when Jesus tells you that you must repent mm. of something truly horrible is going to happen to you, he's trying to let you know you need to turn the direction from where you're going and turn toward God. Because yes. unless you repent, you will truly perish in a horrible fashion, Luke 13 and 3 and following. Yeah. But you also must believe the gospel, how that Christ died for your sins, was buried and rose again the third day. And Jesus said it this way. Here's what Matthew wrote in Matthew chapter 28 and verse number 18. All power in heaven and earth has been given unto me. Now, if Jesus has all power, how much power does Brother Howe have? None. None. How much power does your preacher, your pastor, your pope have? None. None. How much power does your grandmother, your grandfather, whoever you hold in high esteem, how much do they have? None. Jesus said, all power in heaven and earth has been given unto me. Go ye therefore and teach all nations and baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Then teach them all things which I command unto you. And lo, I'm with you always, even until the end of the world. Yes. Amen. Mark was also there when he heard that. And Mark heard Jesus actually say, go and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believes the gospel and is baptized shall be saved. He that believes not shall be damned. That's your choices. You see, a lot of people want to tell you that there's a lot of people out there that want to call Jesus Christ or call him Lord, but, don't, but we're trying to tell you that you don't need to do something that Jesus commanded. I'm just not that smart. Okay. <laughs> so when Jesus says, upon a penitent heart and upon your confession of faith, you'll be baptized in the water for the remission of your sins, that's what you should be doing. Amen. That's, right. that's why we don't baptize babies, because a baby don't have a penitent heart. Baby can't confess a confession of faith. No. We're not teaching water baptism. Right. We're not teaching water salvation. I mean, no. me and my brother, when we used to go to the swimming pool as little kids, we were raised in the church. We go to the swimming pool. You know what we do at the swimming pool? Come up behind each other and grab each other in the name of Jesus and put them up under water and keep them under that until all them sin bubbles stop coming up. <laughs> Did that save my brother? No. <laughs> we were playing. It means nothing without. The, 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 the gospel of Jesus Christ it means nothing without your faith because that's what he commanded the reason we baptize in water because Jesus said water unless a man is born of the water and of the spirit he cannot see or enter the kingdom of God Amen. so we stand ready if you believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God and you willing to make that confession we'll baptize you in water why because Jesus said water and he's the one doing the work you go down that water in obedience to the gospel and you'll come up rise to walk in newness of life Paul says no you're not that as many of us have been baptized into Christ have been baptized into death that like as Christ was raised by the glory of the Father, even so we should rise to walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Amen. You see, the reason we stand firm on that is because Jesus commanded it and the apostles followed those directions. Amen. And we're going to stand on that till the Lord comes back. If you're a child of God and not been walking faithful to the name that's been put upon you. That's something that you need to do. You don't have to be baptized again if you're a child of God already. This is John chapter 1. That if you confess your sins, he, talking about God, is faithful and just to forgive your sins. And the blood of Jesus Christ continually cleanses you from all unrighteousness. But that only happens if you're already a child of God. So if you have not been walking faithful to the name that's been put upon you, Christian been put upon you, come back in repentance and prayer. If you want to become a child of God and wash your sins away and the Lord add you to his church, come with a penitent heart. Confess in Jesus Christ, we'll baptize you in water. And then, just as you submit to the Lord, you become a priest, part of the royal priesthood. You become kings now because you're in the family of God, yeah. with all the rights and privileges that go along with it. Yeah. And just like Jesus, our forerunner, after he finished his work here on earth, he was ushered into the presence of God, the same thing will happen to us yeah. when our work here is done, Amen. as children of God, yeah. as priests, as the family of God. We'll be ushered into God's presence to be with him forever. Amen. See, that's our motivation. Amen. Decide today that everything that God has commanded us, even the tough things like submitting to our government, the tough things to do, we're doing it because of who our God is and what our God has promised. Decide today, if you're subject to this message in any way, that you want to take advantage of what God is offering you today, won't you come as together we stand and sing the encouragement.